for us, the member and partners of the Nicholas Palanza Institute, uh, it is a great pleasure that this year's annual lecture in the memory of Nikos uh, Polanzas is given by Kostadino Sukalas. For us, this is a landmark lecture. It is a 15th uh, lecture made by a Greek thinker. In 2022, we'll celebrate the 25-year anniversary since the establishment of our institute. So, we have many anniversaries, and given this uh, fact, we couldn't possibly have found a better speaker for this very important lecture than Costadinos Sukalas, because I believe that Costadinos is uh, probably the most important living Greek social scientist with great international recognition and influence. His prolific writing, educational and public work has nourished generations of uh, scientists, and he has acquainted many of us with the principles and values of uh, justice. But we also have his close relation with Nikos Balanzas, as he himself says, he had a connection with Nikos Polanza since the age of uh, 15. They had a friendly, brotherly relationship of camaraderie. They shared the same wanderings and quests and doubts and engagement in politics. So Kalas studied law, but he was not entra entrapped in its uh, realm. He maintained the rigor of legal thinking, but he abandoned the doctrinality of law and he embarked on a long journey in uh, social and humanistic education. He is a Greek that has a political party identity. He belongs to the local organization of enlightenment. His work constituted a foundation of sociology. But for the past few years, Tukalas, along with uh, political sociology, turned from uh, the part to the whole, from the local to the universal, from the Greek to the global. But can theory and philosophy help us understand the meaning of the world and forge the politics of resistance and transcendence, you would ask? What is the function of a person thinking today? What is the role of critique in an environment where dealing or delving rather in delving in theory is something that is evaluated in accordance with management criteria, rewarding whatever is risk free, conventional and commonplace. How is it that a solitary thinker can think of something that transcends the solitude and singularity of thought? Every pair seeks moral legitimization. And this is precisely the role of establishment intellectuals today. This is the role that uh, Tsukalas denounces with his life and work. His thought is coming to shake prevalent perceptions, because in the same way as great thinkers of the 20th century, Russell, Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Derrida, and our own Castoriadis, Manesses, Polanzas, like them, Tsukalas represents radical enlightenment. Truth and knowledge do not merely reflect reality, they are strategy for its radical change. They are battlefields that we enter equipped with moral principles, historic conscience and political values. These values enable the intellectual to judge, deplore and resist the commands of power and the banalities of public opinion. Since the times of uh, Socrates, Knowledge and truth are inseparable companions of beauty. Today, the truth has become the property of technocrats. Ethics, legitimization of power, politics, logistical negotiations, and as truth and morality and politics grow weaker, we lose aesthetics and beauty. According to philosopher Immanuel Kant, Aesthetic judgment combines knowledge with action, what is with what ought to be, and this plan that combines the regulatory and the beautiful. We have the four recent books of uh, Tsukala, The Invention of Avenus in the year 2010, The Naked Queen, The Invisible Leviathan, and The Return of Politics, 2020. These four books constituted a trilogy in the same way as we see Lawrence Darrell, Alexandra and Quartet, or like the 30 paintings of uh, Saint-Victoire that Paul Cézanne painted from different angles and perspectives. Gradually in his tetralogy, Tsukalas is building the different aspects of a modern world, a system of thought and action, power, 
on subjects in the double sense of the word. The individual who is a foundation of freedom because the person is subjected, a person who is autonomous because they obey. In, in this way, like the masterpiece of Georges Perec, life, user's manual, Tsukalas is constructing the building where we live, room by room and floor by floor. We can call his quartet politics, manual for use, abuse and disuse. Glancing at the floors, naked queen, this is the science of economics. It has been proclaimed queen of social sciences, displacing critical, philosophical, historic and sociological thinking. In the orbit of Palani, Tsukalas describes exhaustively the features of the social non-contract of this day and age. What are these? Economy becomes autonomous. Politics used to be autonomous, but it is subjected and it becomes fully heteronomous. Political order accepts its marginalization, which is supposedly the requirement and prerequisite for an incessant growth invented by the philosophical stone of alchemist economists. Individual interest is elevated to a basic driving force and its unconditional promotion is presented as realistically necessary and morally justified. Liberal capitalism, of course, was to begin with a self-interested rightocracy with individual ownership being right number one and model for every other right. Now a formalism, a procedural justice and a standardized otherness corroborate the choices of homo economicus. This depoliticized and dehistoricized science of economics erected the cognitive scaffoldings of the invisible leviathan. Why invisible, you would ask? The globalized power of market economy is omnipresent, but we cannot see it. It imposes behaviors, but it does not speak. It constitutes a rhizomatic ectoplasm connecting national and supranational rackets without being elected, without being controlled, without accounting to anyone. It constitutes a Kafkaesque machine, cold, implacable, ruthless, with no leniency to people or peoples. Like the other torture machine in Kafka's penal colony, its silent function appears only in its outcomes. Hunger, disease, destitution, death, imprinted in the flesh of persons, people, nations. In the history of uh, Borges, the emperor asks cartographers to make the most precise and correct map of the territory. The map they make has the exact same size as the empire itself. Leviathan repeats this endeavor. Leviathan maps and tries to change the globe placing what is and what ought to be, or wish and normalcy, in the same framework. They coexist in synchronization. The dynamics of enlightenment and the metaphysics of modernity created a distance almost imperceptible between what is and what ought to be, with what ought to be acting as a correction of the order of the world. In this interim space between the two, we had room for great radical ideas, utopias, progressive reforms. It is precisely this space that is closing now in a world where no idea or value reflects a justful moral content and no policy corrects what is. This invisible but abysmal machine has started sneezing and crushing when a tiny organism a parasite, a virus, got caught in its cogs, faced with the ghost of a huge disaster. Political managers of social symbiosis no longer had the luxury of fortifying themselves before, or behind rather, the automations of the market. Life stopped throughout the world. It was as if a master switch went off, even though government said that economy cannot decelerate in order to protect the planet from climate change and destruction. 
the extraordinary need, the emergency and the state of exception led to the silent rebound or return of politics, as Tsukala said. Right, politicians from Johnson to Macron and Mitsotakis had to go back to society and the state, temporarily suspending the orders of a naked queen. The social state, which was demonized to such an extent, transformed from an unreliable, ineffective father figure to a supporter and redeemer when the going went tough. A crevice opened, not a window, but a porthole of opportunity in the suffocatingly insulated edifice of Leviathan. We have everywhere the return of politics, public goods, health, education, social welfare. But we can discern that the return has only been temporary, penance only superficial, the normalcy prepared by governments is nothing but Leviathan, again adorned and superficially changed. Our governors, defeated ideologically, become hypocritical defenders of the public that they are going to surrender to the wolves of the market. Propagandists of morality and law, they confuse the private interests with public virtue. But there is a more radical return, you know. Needs that reminded us of uh, values and institutions which can actually protect people. We were faced with uh, social and biological vulnerability concealed by the narcissism and consumerism of the previous fictitious prosperity. We realized that in a state of emergency, it's not individualism that can save us, but social solidarity and caring for one another. Only public goods and services can safeguard biological and social survival. As Costadino said, biological and intellectual solidarity allude to empathy, relation, openness of every entity to the rest. It has a meaning, as Jean-Luc Nancy said. There is a meaning to it when we have a union of unique worlds whereby everyone is exposed to other people when we share wishes, frustrations and hopes. So it appears that history has not said its last word. The necessary return of the relevant autonomy of the state opens new potentials when we see the doctrine of full deregulation collapse. I suppose that a similar concern could include all global states of emergency. Hope returns. The anthropology of Costadinos allows him to understand the tragic nature of the nature of man and, of course, the strength of transcendence, as Marx said, man transcends man. So, next to business as usual, we see the hesitant appearance of uh, the wish called utopia. Normalcy as a single value prohibits utopia. However, all big ideas and changes started as utopias through the effort to put to words what does not exist now, as Bloch said, and as Costadinos repeats in every book of his, we see the creation of the prerequisites for another society. A map of the world, Oscar Wilde wrote, which does not include utopia is useless because it leaves out the only country to which humanity always alights. The wager of Pascal today is about the advent of what is not here yet, not in the sense of an idealistic past or perhaps an elusive future. What is called utopia is the power of imagination, discovering the future latent in the present. We see daily the fragments of utopias in the cities of hospitality and resistance where underground and humble teams set up networks of solidarity for the weak and the sick, good Samaritans of a secularized love, a philanthropy which is away from superficial humanism that reduces the earth to an object of disastrous exploitation, away from the cosmopolitanism of nihilistic values. This is both normalcy and utopia of human nature. It's all about camaraderie, friendship, generosity, hospitality, response and solace to loneliness, estrangement, melancholy. Here lies the big responsibility of the left. Its solvency depends on its 
perpetual engagement in the plan for radical change, rapture, a social transformation, always founded in science and documented. If the clarity of the vision gets blurry, if the left gives way to the demands of an indeterminate normalcy, then what is afforded by its moral, political, imaginary advantage will be lost and the same thing will happen to its symbolic capital. It is to these values and to these visions that Costa Dinos has made the greatest of contributions. I'm looking forward to hearing your lecture, Costa Dinos, because you build yet another flaw in the building of our lives and our visions. Right, well, Costas, uh, I'm afraid you said everything, okay? In in a way, you've already uh, spoke before I did, and you covered everything I wanted to say. I was about to say the same things. For better or for worse, we agree on everything. Costas Rodina says, well, I hope we could um, probably disagree on something. Costas Rodina Tsukala says, well, we can try, but it's not going to be easy. Right, I should like to thank you very much, first of all, not only for your very kind words but also for the fact that you invited me here, which for me has a great symbolic significance and importance, because, as you said, I was a chum, I was best friends with Puladzas, he was my closest friend. And at the same time, he too was one with whom I escaped, well, uh, the narrow confines of um, uh, the um, law department and uh, uh, what uh, ought to be done and what is. And this may have um, a supplemental importance, the fact that I entitled my paper, my lecture for another republic, because this is a title of a book of my friend Dimitris Tsatsos who was the one who had, well, contained me and kept me from, uh, well, um, um, pushing away and uh, denying all my relationship with uh, the legal uh, science. And he is the one who managed to make me relation um, of, of legal. And Puladzas was who made me uh, so the relativism of the well-known and standardized opinions of what is and what ought to be. So, in this sense, this coincidence is very important for me and rather moving or emotional in a sense. I was asked to give you uh, the background and as a fact, I was asked four or five months ago, and it was Xenophon Kondiadis to be more precise, to write an epimeter uh, on a big book of Tzatzos that would be called Republic. I mean, he, he used the title used by Plato and he tries not to judge Plato but to overcome to go over and beyond Plato. Now, it was a, a book that was issued by um, Gavrilidis Publications and it was reduced to pulp. It's one of those books that the um, National Bank um, thought that it would be uh, to the benefit, I would say, of the lender, of the publishing hounds that went bankrupt, to turn them, reduce them to pulp. It's a reduction to pulp of the idea of the Republic, which has a symbolic content maybe, which is very difficult, very complex and multi-layered. So we have Tsatsos on the one hand, Puladzas on the other, and I should like to say that they are both dead, and in a way I have been a witness to both deaths of Puladzas in Paris and of Tsatsos, whom I saw, and I will never forget this in my life, holding in his hands Two, hand, two days before he died, the copy of the Republic that they had just given him and he couldn't even hold in his shaky hands, he dropped it. These two deaths are still tormenting me, torturing me from within. So being here today is as though I'm mourning my two friends. Okay? And... Um, um, they have to do both as regards my legal education, prior education, and my wider theoretical effort of dealing things the way I do today. And it is through this 
process and procedure that I'm trying to answer a series of questions that I cannot possibly do. What is the big question that we all have to face today? Costas already mentioned it. I mean, in essence, what I'm going to say is just a repetition, as it were, of what Costas just said. But be that as it may, I will repeat them, actually. So what is, what is the problem today? What is republic? What is an organized republic? How do we define what is political? Our um, ancestors had already resolved the problem. They uh, came up with the idea of the demos, the idea of the polis, and the idea of democracy. Plato came up with the idea of the republic, or the polity, to um, um, put everything under the same uh, umbrella. And they set the issue of how to organize and establish and found this common demos. Of course, the problem was forgotten in the Middle Ages. So in the in, in Middle Ages, uh, no one talks about anything that has to do with how to organize society. Society is a given then. But from a point onwards, the question comebacks as unavoidable, as insurmountable. And it's not by chance that the title of the work of Tzatzos Republic ten years ago and the title of Tzatzos that I re-adopt now, Republic, the New Republic, is a sort of an attempt to reposition and relocate these problems in today's conjuncture, which is certainly different than what it was ten years ago. And I need to say something else. Tantos didn't just write about the Republic. He invented a new um, term for his approach. So he, he was not um, um, convinced and he was not happy with uh, politiology. He transformed it into the uh, post or meta politiology. And he's saying that the traditional word about um, um, Republic, which is uh, philosophical, it is institutional, legal and sociological at the same time, is impossible to be exhausted through the traditional approaches. And the words, the very words we use, the very terms, the fundamental terms with which we are working and we're trying to read and understand our surroundings are inadequate. They're inadequate and they are um, 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 misleading because the words betray us, they mislead us, they disorient us, and at the same time they bind us, they keep us captured, and they sub submit us, they subdue us. The same way that the word republic means nothing, and it means everything, in that very same sense the word republic or polity is a binding one. All we can think is by using the term republic, democracy, demos, and all the rest. So, all the words have started being signifiers without signified or specific signified. It's, it's a time or an era in which we're certain about nothing. We are in the century of ambivalence, of um, 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 radical doubt, not only about um, what is and what ought to be, but also about the way we ourselves can deal with and to talk about all these things. This is the century of meta, meta politiology, says Tzatzus. I would take it even further. We are at the century of meta enlightenment, meta philosophy, of meta truth. Obviously, meta-modernity, which is uh, a word that means absolutely nothing, if you ask me. So, it's, it's not by chance that the former um, 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 president of Facebook, Mr. Zuckerberg, talked about the meta-world, the metaverse. So, the Greek word meta with verse, which is part of the universe. So, it's a meta-verse, it's a meta-universe. But this prefix, meta, signifies something else. It, it absolves the one using it from the need to analyze, to explain, interpret and evaluate what they see, the visible reality. Meta, me, meta means that it's not exactly what it was, but we don't know precisely what it is. So when we're talking about meta-modernity, we're talking about something that is not entirely the same with modernity, but we can't say exactly what it is. So 
Uh, what remains is a stale and an answer question of what is this world in which we're living? How can we understand what is, is and what ought to be is? It's meta-thought and meta-thinking does not need to give answers. And this is precisely why it cannot be disputed or questioned. Costa said earlier about the lack of the um, uh, eclipse, rather, of the idea of the utopia. It means that a utopia is something that does not exist. And we're thinking about a projection in the future of something that we hope might sometime exist. But utopia escapes what exists. And by escaping what exists, the very sense of utopia is nothing more than an attempt, an effort to interpret what is in view of what ought to be in the future. But why does this happen? Well, because, Mr. like Mr. Duzina said before me, at the moment, everything is subdued under a given universal system which uh, I call the Leviathan. What does that entail? It entails a series of ends, of eclipses, the end of the political, the eclipse of the political, and Costas talked about that, but not only that, the eclipse and the end of history, like Mr. Fukuyama says, the eclipse of ideology, the eclipse and end of critical thought, critical thinking. And, of course, uh, the complaint of all those who do not want to take this end as an, ex as an eclipse, as someone who is a fool, who is silly, who is uninformed. So they're saying to us that politics, polity and the republic, cannot be considered as values in and of themselves. They are the derivatives and the results of a system. And this is why polit politics is not into guiding the truth and the reality and the fantasy and the imagination of a new reality. The word management is not by hand, it's not by accident. It's called management. Why does it mean? Well, it means that the very sense of participating, deciding, acting and changing is not permitted before a reality that can change because it is what it is. And nothing but that, which is exactly why government, governments until now, until today, uh, did not rule. They governed. This governance, this word governance, has substituted the word rule. It's no longer government, it's governance. What does governance mean? It means that you are no longer the one who decides what will happen. You're the one who manages what is already there. This, of course, exists in the liberal thought and liberal thinking and the liberal doctrine from as early as the 19th century. But, well, this, this breakthrough that made this perception full, dominant and total is um, back in, the, in 1989. It's the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's the end of the Cold War, it's the moment when the major um, ideological wager has been cancelled of how the world will be. It's the moment at which everyone appears to agree that there's nothing else than an existing world, a world that is there. So from 1981, uh, 1989 excuse me, onwards there is only one doctrine which is ecumenically and um, um, universally present that imposes on politics to uh, limit itself to a simple reproducer of what is systemically a given, a fact. There is no room for experimentation and it's not by accident that um, in Germany the uh, motto of the right was for 20 years keine Experimente, no experiments. So there is no risk, there is no inventing, there is no dreaming, there is no hoping and primarily there is no intervening. Because the competence of the politician, or the political rather, is uh, to maintain what is already there. That's the competence of the 
being, of the one and single reality. So that's how this um, Tina doctrine was um, um, imposed. It's the no alternative doctrine, which means two things at the same time, not only one. One is that this world is the only rational world there is. All other worlds are irrational. So the power of uh, thought and rationality means this, but it means another thing, that we have no other option as people than to be subdued. It is something that um, is both normative and it ascertains. So this Tina doctrine represents better than anything the actual, true, political and ideological omnipotence of the, ne of the liberal ideology. And all this, well, it's been 30 years, more than 30 years since 1989. More or less, everything appeared to be under control. For many a year, there was no serious questioning or dispute of a situation that was a given and more or less accepted by everyone. But history, once again, proved that it was more devious and, and coy than what people suspected in the system showed that it cannot be reproduced in and of itself and ad infinitum, in perpetuity, unless it intervenes. Everything is in flux. Everything is in flux because history knows better than those who are as naive as to believe that they can control it. Which is why we have such crises. The market not only resolves these crises, but it does not want to um, resolve them. It perpetuates them. So even as controlled or as derivative or as a managing, it's what Mr. Duzina said earlier. Politics is necessary. Which is why Plato de facto not only never left, not only must it re must come back, but it's also a way and a tool with which we can deal with reality. But today something else is happening. It's not just the crises, and I will come back to that later. It's also the fact of um, um, the phenomenon that we call globalization. The world and its problems are one and the same. Today's limits of this self-replicating systemic automatism are not given. And this is what actually made unavoidable the question that I raised in the beginning. What is and what ought to be the Republic? And this is the most urgent, the most pressing matter that is asked to one and um, all of us. Um, it, the future cannot be what is today. And this impasse is a catalyst. And this dates back 200 years, you know. And it is linked with the perception of the idea of progress. What is progress? This is uh, the new thing. It's um, the idea to rationalize or to try to rationalize and to dream and to achieve the coming of a better world. It is the modern Promethean vision, if you if you like. This, however, until 1800 and something was the object of a constant debate, um, deliberation and contradiction and everything. It stopped being that from as of 1850 onwards, at least. Progress has stopped being the object of a discussion. We know what it is. What is, um, um, what is it? It's a single thing. It's quantitative growth. Productivism. But growth and profit is only quantified by numbers, by growth by magnification. And this, unfortunately, did not happen only in those um, capital market systems. From day one, this very belief was expressed by the revolutionary authorities and powers. 
and maybe in a way that was more intense and intense and more monolithic than it was in in the West. The Soviet Union, um, during Stalin's time and even before that, sets um, and raises the issue of the constant increase and magnification and growth of the productive powers. And this is the prerequisite for the change in the social relations. It's the Marxist motto, as you very well know. The result being, uh, that's from 1920 or 1925 onwards, the Soviet Union working on the basis of five-year plans. What are the five-year plans? How to better and faster grow in the Soviet Union's their productive powers. So in a way, something that was already happening de facto in the West for over a century becomes a doctrine in the communist East. So the entirety of the Western world, the entire, be it socialist or capitalist, um, starts to identify progress with growth and development. But this is unforeseen. This is unforeseen. No one else was thinking in these terms. I would like to open a parenthesis here. This, of course, does not mean that growth and development is something that we do not want. Far from it. I'm not among those who support degrowth or zero growth. Far from it. It simply means that magnification or growth or development is only one of all the constituents and parameters on the basis of which we will think about and ponder about progress. So what ought to, to be should not be quantified. It should be quantified and qualified. It should be a critical weighing of quality and quantity. We should not always revert to what is more. It should be reverting to what is better. And this was the canvas, if you will, on which the European philosophy worked uh, during the Enlightenment. What was Enlightenment? They were discussing about what was good from as early as the 18th century. And by mid-19th century, it was a constant debate and a discussion with the participation even of Adam Smith, the par excellence, if you want, the father of um, economics, who um, um, discovered Homo economicus. And he discovered with Homo economicus, he, he conceived the theory of moral emotions. He all, also knew very well that it's not just productivism and growth that are good things, or growthism. This story needs to be put together and weighed commonly, vis-à-vis -vis what it has to do with uh, moral um, emotions and, and human relations, what it, role it plays in human relations. Alas, for nearly 100 years, this growthism or productivism that is uh, relentless and unbridled has been made possible why? Well, because the key, the main channel through which this um, perception goes to people is the subjective stances of persons, of man. Everyone wants more things for themselves and for themselves alone. Homo economicus is at the same time homo consumans a consuming human and a magnifying or maximizing person. So the new world, the new era that dawns, forgets two and a half years of philosophy dealing with what is good and what is evil, puts in the parenthesis 2,000 years of philosophical thinking. They forget Tantalus, they forget Sisyphus, but at the same time they forget Socrates, Plato, Buddha and Confucius alike. All these great philosophers of the past are thinking and pondering about what is good, what must we do, and this is forgotten. It is put in a historical parenthesis. And instead of that, we have the greatest invention of the liberalism, which is the individual, individualism, homo economicus, who 
delimits the entire system of human motives and incentives. An English philosopher, who is Michael Oakeshott, is talking about the establishment of some sort of scientific moralizing. A moralizing tendency that includes the entire system of logical incentives of human behavior. And it boils down to a single dimension. That's what is a lot is also good, making us forget everything that we used to know, and it is mentioned in our own Greek um, 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 tradition that says it's all about moderation, that it's uh, quantity, not quality, it's love one another, uh, as, as you do yourself. And this is expressed through ideas, more abstract ideas, that are exceptionally, uh, well, they exist until today but with a different um, um, content, such as reciprocity, um, solidarity, cooperation, compassion, brotherhood, fraternité, say uh, the French in the French Revolution, but also equality. But what is equality? Equality does not mean equalization. It means equality and parity before the laws and equality before the capability of everyone to survive. It is these ideas that, if you like, um, um, accompanied the moral self-perception of man from the very beginning of the world in all big um, um, cultures, from China and from Greece and Rome and everywhere, they have um, been um, thwarted out. And people keep talking about these things and they are outside their everyday life. But they, they, there are two other fundamental ideas that lose their content and are repeated without having any uh, meaning. It's humanity and the value of humanism. All these have ceased to be able to operate. So here's a question. How can we return, how can we uh, revert and go back? How can we... Um, go back to a more complex, to a more well-documented and logically more clear and rational understanding of the idea of progress. How can we uh, wonder again what is good and what is bad? How, what can we think about what ought to be when the free market and the Leviathan does not allow one to do so? And they do nothing more than to intensify the contradictions and the impasses and the deadlocks and to include this productivistic opinion and view of the world. And there is another element. There is the element of time. All these values appear and are conceived as timeless. So time, when we're talking about the idea of man and the idea of solidarity, is not contained within a specific time frame. It is something that exists ad infinitum, in perpetuity, eternally. On the contrary, this maximalization and consumerism have a very clear time constraint, have very clear time limits. The profit is now, it's for now, it's for immediately now. It thinks about the future as something that is controllable in the immediately foreseeable time. Which is why, for this reason, it's much more difficult to imbue someone, uh, for someone to imbue the need of a full revision of a timeless value than what it is to convince them to abandon this short-lived, short-sighted opinion that only in quantity there is quality. And things flowed this way, more or less. But then other problems arise that were unforeseen and unprecedented in history, in intensity, in duration and in um, gravity, in, in behemoths as well. Climate crisis, 
desertification, droughts, the epidemics that most likely have to do with uh, the change in the environment, but they are the same phenomenon. But also something that is very important, I believe, is the overpopulation a massive um, um, catapult-like increase of the people, of the numbers in the very close environment that is the planet, which leads inescapably with a mathematic certainty to the mass movement of populations, which in turn leads to the corrosion, the erosion from within or revision of the ideological, social and financial prerequisites for the existence of very well-built and entrenched societies. In this sense, our world has to do with contradictions that were non-existent until today, and they are un unsolvable. So, they would require interventions and regulations that the free market neither wants uh, nor can um, um, envision and um, implement. But also the systemic authorities resist, resist very heavily at all levels. But why? Because as we said, the new systemic powers and authorities minimize, or at least wish to minimize, their intervention in, in everything. And at the same time, they minimize they want to minimize the cost of any intervention they make what do i mean by that that from a certain point onwards all powers and all authorities of the past 30 or 40 years have as their motto do not tax what does that mean do not tax it means that the state all states even um, the ones uh, that um, in, in things that are necessary or as entirely necessary for um, the reproduction of the system need to be frugal. They um, uh, need to not have the possibility to spend more wealth or to draw more wealth than is absolutely necessary. What does that mean? It means that, in a way, the strict fiscal frugality is a necessary condition for the neoliberal theory of state and of the limits of the republic. However, there's a second element to that. The fact that the system, the new Leviathan, it's no longer something that one can touch upon and actually identify in space. It is an invisible, informal, yet omnipotent composition of supranational financial groups that know no home country, they are nomads, and they circulate freely, they roam the world with no difficulty whatsoever. And at the same time, we have debilitated, dependent state entities with interwoven connections and the international offsuits that do what they please, ratifying, in reality, whatever happens and I'm talking about the IMF, the World Trade Organization, and the World Bank. What do these institutions do? They intertwine what they do with financial and political powers in order to construct a globalized prevalent doctrine that limits the ability of uh, political powers to find resources and, in fact, spend what they find. This is obvious if one thinks of what happens in Europe, which perhaps constitutes the most important post-war experiment of a new percep perception about what a new state could be and what could happen to 
interstate relations that could be built on a more rational and more humanistic paradigm. This is tragic irony, in fact. The European Union to which we belong, fortunately, I need to say that things would have been far worse had Greece not been a member of state of the European Union. The European Union was the biggest and only experiment ever endeavoured in the past few years, aiming at establishing requirements for a pair that could in fact overcome national dead ends and impasses. It's the only experiment that one could think capable of going beyond national competitiveness by promoting new common supranational priorities. It's the only experiment that actually endeavoured to capture new societies re-moralized on the basis of universal values. And within this framework, it is the only experiment which threatens, within inverted commas, to redefine the concept of progress and recompose the notion of democracy on a wider scale. Is it, is it by accident that nothing like this happened outside Europe? Europe for 400 years was the lighthouse, the beacon that the world looked at because it was in fact the quintessence of moral, realistic growth. Is it by accident that this new overall perception of a new state never extended to Africa, Latin America, or any other part of the world for that matter. It was undermined to begin with on the level of sovereignty, of the maximizing growth-centered reasoning. It had no rival. Europe goes on being maximizing and purely liberal but also on the level of uh, state competencies. Europe saw to it, to begin with, that it could break free from the responsibility of fiscal policy. So it defined, or rather it appointed a central European uh, bank that is autonomous and does what it pleases, to put it simply. So on a fiscal level, the prevalence of frugality and austerity, the shrinkage of the publicly controlled wealth on all levels, on the level of uh, central European power of communities, which is the only quasi-state that I know of which does not control more than 2% of the overall product of Europe. 2% is nothing if you think about it, even if central Europe wanted to pursue social policies, it has no means to go by. That is why it has abandoned any intervention regarding insurance systems, education, reallocation of income. All this cannot possibly concern the community of Europe, but only states. States at the same time, however, undergo Absolute manipulation in the same sense. Europe has no money because you can't do things with 2%. And states themselves, on the other hand, are subjected to a constant pressure on the part of the European Union to go on being frugal and austere for the first time. The budgets need to be balanced. For the first time, Europe imposes to the member states a suffocating control of public debting. Public debt is not allowed to exceed a certain percentage of uh, the country's income. What does it mean? It means that from a certain point onwards, the European system prohibits both central governments and member states to do anything else but to manage what is there in the most frugal of ways.
then the problem becomes even worse, because in this way we see the reversal of all the trends and tendencies that had emerged in the past. Let's not forget that from the year 1945 to 1975, that is 35 years of uh, European social democracy, was a period of time characterized by an ever greater accumulation of wealth, concentration of wealth in the hands of the state, and a greater uh, reallocation of resources, incomes and potential. The 30 glorious years These are the glorious years of social democracy. But as soon as it encountered the first difficulty at the end of the 70s, social democracy in effect collapsed ideologically speaking. Social democracy has no raison d'être, if you think about it, since it doesn't even bother to endeavor to be worthy of its convictions to rise up to its convictions on beliefs. And this is not only true for social democracy, it's true for the entirety of the political system in Europe. Even the left, the communist left, that is, or the European communist left, or any other organized left in uh, Europe for the past 10-15 years, has to comply with what is there, even though sometimes it announces reallocations of funds in order to enhance healthcare systems, for instance, all this is so small, it's so finite, it's so controlled that it cannot possibly lead to radical change of social inequalities and injustices. But there's something else which is also catalytical uh, about Europe. One of the most devious or sly institutional achievements of the founders of Europe is that they enacted, either explicitly or tacitly in certain occasions, unanimity as a prerequisite for decision-making. What does it mean? It means that, in effect, if a state has serious disagreements on a matter, can exercise its right to veto. At a first glance, this appears to enhance the power of different states. In reality, however, it entails the exact opposite. And why is that? Because in order not to exercise veto, there is a method, there is a method which is the simplest one and the most effective one, the one of postponement, of deferring of writing off the agenda, an item that not everyone agrees on, that is, I do not talk about it, I don't discuss, I'm speaking in the first person as if I were the, 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 the greatest enthusiast of Europe, but anyway, they don't talk about things and they choose to omit certain things from the agenda. The easiest of things is to say that I, as a pair, have the right to either discuss or not discuss something. This is the most counter-democratic thing, uh, in fact. What does democracy denote? It denotes the ability of every single person to broach a matter before the People's Assembly, or the Demos Ecclesia, as we say it in ancient Greek, and this, in fact, led, inevitably, to contradiction or opposition. Is it by accident that after 50 years of European course, we don't have Euro-opposition? It's not an accident. It's not by random. Because, in fact, the sly trick employed by those that first conceived the idea was that indecision safeguards inertia, doing nothing, immobility. When one is small and they cannot do things, they have no other solution because they're powerless. So they can keep quiet, 
They can be inert or they can leave, but if they leave, they'll suffer the consequences as it happened to pariahs. If they stay, they cannot speak, of course, because they have nothing to speak of. It's off the agenda. In this sense, unanimity is perhaps the most anti-democratic attribute. It appears to be democratic, but this is the most counter-democratic, anti-democratic decision-making system. It reman reminds me of uh, what was described by George Orwell in Animal Farm. It's the best way to perpetuate a state of affairs whereby some animals are always, by definition, more equal than the rest. There is, of course, the likelihood of ostracization. They are the pariahs of the European Union. So these people or parties are obliged to either comply or keep quiet. However, in effect, doing nothing and being inert does not entail non-power, the opposite. It means that the exercise of power has started taking a slippery slope, following directions that didn't used to exist in the past. It's not autonomous politics controlling financial interests, seeing to it that these interests comply with certain things and handle these interests, nor is it a policy that handles its own neutral bureaucracy. Autonomous interests concentrate on one hand, and on the other hand we have established bureaucracies that have control over the political. The European Union on the level of community and on the level of uh, nations and states is heteronymous. It's entirely heteronymous. On one hand, we have the totality. Unable to produce systemically a condition that will promote Europe on a global system. On the other hand, the member states are blackmailed at all times in order to adjust and adapt to reality. That is, they have to let others exercise true power, and these others are somewhere, and nobody knows exactly where. But what is this other than an institutionalized official and unsurmountable conservatism? The conservation of a system is the quintessence of political self-maintenance, that is, denial of political thought, uh, refusal to discuss anything related to progress and what can be done to achieve progress. As a result, power is not seen, and decisions are made following backstage deliberations and endless bargaining. And it goes without saying that we have uh, the strong overriding the weak. So veto and unanimity enhance inertia and the inability to act. And at the same time, they allow certain pariahs within inverted commas to blackmail. The examples of Hungary and Poland are notable cases in question. For example, there is no veto against the stability pact. There are vetoes for secondary things for which Poland and Hungary um, have certain opinions that they call national opinions and they aim at making specific benefits. So it appears that everything is going in accordance to plan. Uh, systemically controlled and self-reproduced developmental automation leads to the prevalence of the market, which is definitive and long-term, even 
crises and recessions are self-regulated. Let's not forget that Peter, when he talked about crisis, talked about destructive, creative destructions, rather, or disasters. Until we reach the, the state of affairs of today, climate, dead ends, and all the interconnected impulses, they create the need for this state of affairs to be managed as a state of emergency. Otherwise, there is threat of uh, changing and subverting any traces of consent. That is why the political is coming back at all costs. It needs to come back with a relevant autonomy, and indeed it is coming back. And here we can broach a final question, which, in my opinion, is indeed topical and very important. How is it that the political returns? It returns in a fragmented an uncoordinated form. The most important contradiction of the last years in our day and age is that the scales of uh, what is at stake, the, the level of the problems, is infinitely greater than the scale and the level of interventions and solutions. The problems are globally indivisible and at the same time political decisions are by definition divided and divisive sometimes. And so we have the generation of a big implicit ideological and political front. On one hand, we have the planet, human values, humanity. And the only thing that we can look up to as a prospect altogether. And on the other hand, the already divided, fragmented and inherently competitive uh, different political powers. That is, the states, the nations and all these collectivities that we see. On one hand, we have the needs of the planet and the human race and on the other hand, we have national interests. And here we need to examine one of uh, the latest side effects of individualism. One needs to understand that society, states and nations have or grow a conscience and act as if they were people, as if they were persons. Societies are big worlds that agglomerate persons and these worlds function in the exact same way as individuals do, in a self-centered manner. Collectivities have uh, common financial, national and political interests. What happened at the meeting in Glasgow the day before yesterday is most characteristic. What happened, you'd ask? Nothing. Rhetory, bargaining and a general inertia. They were not able to work it out and agree on something in the same way as leaders cannot work it out and that's why we have wars and the rest. And in Glasgow the same thing happened, wishful thinking. From 3.5 they'll reduce pollution to 2.5 but always on condition that something happens. And why is it that this occurs? Because in effect everyone knows that as it happens in reality, all problems and all disasters cannot have the same impact on everyone indiscriminately in the same way and to the same extent. Some people will suffer the consequences today, others tomorrow. Some people will never suffer the consequences. In this sense, all countries, all political powers, all nations function in a certain way as... Uh, future free riders, that is, every state separately, every nation, every collectivity, every group, every collective entity aims at minimizing the costs and damage, any damage they may suffer, and at the same time they want to maximize the benefit and what they have to gain. In this sense, all these 
free riders that we mentioned are stallions, we would say, not only of institutions and powers, but also of ideas and values. And this is perhaps the greatest impasse of today's uh, groups. National politics or global politics? A dead end. Suffocating. All of us. Everyone. And of course the nationalistic right, which has been uh, growing very fast in Europe and the world over, and this is not by accident. The bad thing is that this very thing has been pervading the left rapidly. Democracy cannot be constructed in an abstract manner, you know. By definition, it presupposes strictly delineated and defined bodies on layers, layers that are conducive to democratic processes. People interested in public opinion giving the opportunity for the construction of uh, national states of people expressing themselves as political beings accountable to citizens. Humanity, however, and the overall problems humanity is faced with do not constitute an organized whole. Humanity cannot be engaged in discourse and contradiction. The only thing that it can produce is desperate people, victims, people. That's why I believe that the most suitable end is what Herbert Marcuse chose in his uh, latest book, The Unidimensional uh, Men, which is a phrase of Walter Benjamin. Only for the sake of the desperate can we be given hope. So, in a sense, it's tragic that the struggle against neoliberalism, injustice, and unbridled maximizing productivism and consumerism can be won only as a universal battle. The democratic political power, on the other hand, can exist only in a very fragmented form. And here's the crux to the problem. How is it that we can break free from the dream of constant maximization and growth? I remember that one of the phrases of Miss van der Rohe, the great architect, was less is more. And the postmodern architect Venturi, who was a great architect himself, said, yes, maybe, but less is a bore. Yes. But we can't define this easily. What is boring, that is. The question again, what is necessary? What could be done? How could we pursue the invention of a new universal enlightenment? I do not know, of course, nor can I give you an answer. We need to think anew. We need to think again the content of the concept of uh, progress not only in conjunction uh, with what the philosophers of the 19th and 18th centuries uh, thought, but in conjunction with political and value results of our perception about progress. And we need to understand that no problem can be solved on a national level. At the same time, however, it appears that we do not have what it takes in order to have a universal political power. So perhaps the future of the world depends on the ability of humanity to supersede, in a sense, this democratic impasse. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, right, well, thank you very much, Konstantinos Tsoukalas. You gave us one of, uh, well, your usual 
grandiose wanderings, trips, travels, journeys around our situation, our condition, nationally, internationally. And now he added this new story, this new floor I mentioned, which was the European, about which you spoke so much. And, of course, we stayed and we kept this feeling of the impasse, of this deadlock, of this asphyxiation, in which I believe it is important to be able to give some rational or logical ways out. I called it a porthole, a small window of opportunity. And I believe that this is also important to be able to include it. And I wanted to make a couple of observations, and we do have some questions from the people who um, um, followed your presentation, Costadinos. Just a couple of remarks, observations that uh, came in, and I, I jotted them down uh, the way you were, uh, as you were talking. Uh, what about this meta? This, this notion of meta, of meta republic, is very interesting, but also the other metas. The first meta was metaphysics. So I would say, following your train of thought, that from the moment when metaphysics placed at the epicenter of the world the individual, this is modernist, okay, it replaced God with man. The individual is at the center of the world, and obviously man, humans as the center of the meaning of modernist, have various aspects and various representations. But what prevailed was what led to the metas that you uh, mentioned. So meta modernity, rather, had already included the seed of meta modernity. And of course, what you describe what is happening right now at the time of meta and metaverse was something that was already within. Within the dialectic there were always the resistances and the possibility and the capability for transcendence and change. But it was the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say was something that always uh, struck me as very impressive as I was young. In Greek, the sense of growth and development are usually synonymous. They're used interchangeably. And I remember a professor back in the day who said when I was starting my studies, actually, who said that this sense of development or growth as maximization includes only the production and productiveness, production of um, wares or the production of services. But uh, care, um, what our mother does, what who takes care of us does, what he who tries to help us when we are in difficulty, or the housewife on a daily basis, or the uh, stay-at-home stay husband. These are not considered as being part of the growth or development. They're not measured. So this sense of growth and development as a maximization or um, a magnification detracts from the very heart and the core of this endeavor, all those things that we could imagine and believe that have significance, have meaning, have importance, have a central, a pivotal role in doing what, I, what we are as humans. These are not countable. These are not measurable. It is something that is being done. It's uh, more often than not not paid. It remains unpaid. And it's something that happens and um, uh, is of no interest to the economists. They could care less. And, of course, it, it gives a new direction in what growth and development means. What growth and development means as a feeling, as care, as something that I do not because I'm paid, but because the other always comes before me and I am made and constructed through my relationships with the other. And the third thing I wanted to say is something um, that you said, that um, modernist forgot what is good. It forgot what is um, a virtue, what is um, um, good. So Immanuel Kant, who is um, all about modernity, in his work about enlightenment says that the good, the proper, the virtue was the result of heteronomy. It was what the pre-modernist societies had and stopped, forbade, um, the sense of freedom um, as autonomy. What Kant says and that in modernity what we have is um, we have replaced or we will replace 
the good with the proper or the right. Good and what is right with the law. And what a modernist um, or a modern man does, and this is where the proper, the appropriate, the right or the wrong behavior of him is, is judged and governed, is how they abide by the law. So the good was replaced by a love for law of modernity, an obsession with law. And it, it may be difficult to revisit what is good or what is virtuous outside communities because, well, within the communities, when we find ourselves as comrades around the same table, friends, family, small groups, these small groups that were called the secret and invisible solidarity groups, there we still have the feeling of the good and virtue that is not measured uh, against a law or a deontological moralizing and worship of morality. Now, these were three observations that um, I believe uh, will help you in, say, a few more words. Well, let me answer. I'll answer the last question that you asked about what is good. I believe that the most catalytic answer of Kant was given to Hannah Arendt. She talked about the commonality of what is bad, whereby law, discipline and heteronomy render what is bad neutral. A small change to what Hanadat said would be the same thing applies to what is good. We are at a phase whereby precisely this systemic primacy and prevalence of stereotypes and how should I call them, not laws, but uh, value customs, let me describe them as such, have led to a common perception of uh, what is good, a commonality of what is good. And in a sense, the Kantian request clashes against this new monolithic, unidimensional and bureaucratic reality in the same way as Eichmann didn't know or, or perhaps didn't care whether something was good or bad because he followed the law, he followed the law. I suppose most people today could say the same thing. This is one comment I would like to make responding to what you said. Let me make another one. If I understood correctly, you talked about moral feelings and values that survive naturally within the realm of a family, in the comfort of reciprocity, uniting people who are not yet on the market or they are not in the market at all. The gist is that all these necessary functions that are inevitably reproduced and bequeathed from one generation to the next do not regard the ideology of the powers that be. Think about production coefficients. What are production coefficients? They are not the biological and symbolic prerequisites for the reproduction of people separately, but they are the land, the machines and labour in the typical economic paradigm. What has happened in the meantime? Labour or work has ended up leading to insufficient remuneration, unable to reproduce moral feelings within a family. And at the same time, something else has happened. The machine has not disappeared, but it has given its place to a fourth uh, coefficient of production, the control of information and knowledge at this moment, that is, 
We are faced with a new situation where the role of the landlords of the past, that is those that had inherited power over the basic coefficient of production, has been replaced by what one could call patent owners, knowledge owners, to coin a word, which means that those that are owners of knowledge before the law are beyond any control. Let me give you an example, drawing on what's happening here in Greece today. Is it by accident that Is it by accident that people are uh, requisitioned? For example, it goes without saying that nobody is against that. When there are anesthesiologists and we don't have uh, enough and it's the pandemic, people are officially asked to go and staff hospitals where they are needed. So labor is requisitioned. The machine, the ventilator is requisitioned, but the patent is not. After everything that has happened up until today, the information, the patent, the knowledge, the ability to produce or manufacture drugs goes on being the monopoly of those that have the copyright commandos used to say that this is the most logical form of financing. And he was right to have said that when he said it. But this difference between labor which can be requisitioned, the machine, which can also be requisitioned by a state, and knowledge that cannot be requisitioned, this difference could, I believe, be elaborated on within the framework of a lengthier discussion. We have uh, about 15 minutes until the end of the lecture in our discussion. There are some questions. There are some questions on the part of the audience. I think that it's better for me to repeat some of the questions for technical reasons, so as not to change the focus of the camera all the time, and you give me all the answers at one, okay? Okay, let me read. Let me read the questions for everyone to hear, says Mr. Vazunas. There are two initial questions regarding uh, degrowth. And Mr. Dimitris is asking, how can uh, human imagination change and move towards a society of uh, frugal bounty, as Latour said? Is it is it just to talk about everything in moderation and talk about third world countries that never had the bounty? Uh, of the West. This is a question regarding degrowth and there are two questions I believe many of us have in mind. And of course, there can be no single answer, be it in a few sentences or be it within the time frame of 15 minutes. But anyway, we're interested in your initial ideas. One question regards the future of Europe. What needs to change? What is it that needs to change? European institutions, national powers? Do we need something more universal, more national, or do they need to change at the same time? Or well, both of them need to change. And the last one, which is the $1 million question, says the speaker, is the following. Is the new Leviathan unbeatable? How can we subvert this new Leviathan? Can we, in fact? And there I would say that here indeed lies the responsibility of the left. The small utopias that started re-emerging and returning and the small and invisible or limited return of politics may give us some hope. And it was very nice that you finished with Benjamin and hope. The question, can we break free from the suffocating edifice hosting us, the new Leviathan? This is a question that will follow our discussion for a long time, I believe. 
Well, of course, I'll try to answer, although these questions cannot be answered. It's impossible. However, degrowth. The motto of degrowth was uh, a cleansing one. So Latour and the others managed to put at the epicenter the question of what is a lot and what is good. So the, we should not strive for maximization at all costs. But what I said before is that um, what is little and insufficient cannot be distributed equally to the world, as you very well said. And so the question of growth and development may not be raised separate from the question of distribution of the results and outcomes of growth and development. This was the last point that I wanted to underline, that in a world where at the same time we have a tremendous and catapult-like increase of population primarily among those who are the wronged, uh, who got the short end of the stick in this story. It is impossible to ask the question of the future, of what must be done and how it should be done, unless one attempts to at least come up with a few ways so as to deal in a rudimentary manner this uh, great inequality uh, that um, leads to explosive repercussions. The Chinese at a time tried to do that, and, but the, it stopped. Okay. At the moment, I think India has 1.5 uh, billion. Uh, we are 7 billion people around the world. There is no room on earth for all these people. So the issue of degrowth cannot be seen separately from the world distribution of wealth and the world distribution of unjustness, injustice and inequality. Which is why the doctrine-like obsessions with something saying uh, simply stop producing, stop growing, stop developing, let what you have suffice may only be addressed to the rich, who are also the ones who par excellence have absolutely no problem. In a way, in a sense, one could say this, that the known motto, proletarians of all the world unite, was a logical one. At a time where the inflation of proletariats was a requirement for the creation of a new historical, major historical power that would subvert the system. It would overthrow the system without any damage to the proletariats themselves. At the moment, a comparable system A similar motto would be overpopulations of the world unite could not be based on a demand of increasing overpopulation and thereby an increase of that critical mass that could subvert and overthrow because increase in growth before subverting it would destroy those who actually had this growth and this increase and this is a major problem in my opinion of simple degrowth. And this is why it's particularly difficult for one to uh, manage to convince wider masses of people that are already, if you'd like, um, at a turning point between um, 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 existing and in existence, to stop believing and supporting growth and developmental opinions. So the problem, this problem today becomes increasingly unsolvable, difficult to solve. 
And this is why I talked about Benjamin and the desperate. Who are the desperate? Well, the desperate are those who are, by definition, the lost. They multiply like rabbits. And at the same time, this, this multiplication um, does not help them politically. It, it ruins them in any other way. It, it enrages them, it makes them leave their countries and go elsewhere. It forces them to live in environments in which they're not welcome, to, to say the least. And it renders them, it makes them the catalyst of destruction of societies that are otherwise structured. This is one. Now, what can I say about the future of, um, of Europe? Changes should be done both in individual member states, but also in the community system. But on both levels, the community and the member states, these are very difficult to happen. And I will make this very simple observation, if I make, if I may. What is the main, the most powerful instrument in Europe? It's the so-called commission. Isn't it a characteristic that um, um, this body, this instrument, was called a commission? It's the most faceless and false instrument. It's the commission that is uh, the power. But by calling it a commission, they remove from the body and the instrument the symbolism of authority and power. The president of the commission, who is in essence the prime minister of Europe, of the European Union, they're not called the prime minister, they're called the president of the commission. These are symbolic games, I would say, but they show how difficult it is for one to achieve long-term compromises and um, power uh, coalitions that can function both on the level of the member states as well as at the level of the community as a whole. And to make things more precise and more concise, one of the biggest problems that Europe has to deal with, and it's not now, it's been for the past 30 years, it's the internal balance and equilibria that where there, there were three or four countries that questioned more or less whose first have disappeared. Uh, we, the UK left, and what we have is United Germany, which in essence has the position, who is in a position to impose its own opinions. Can this change? I do not know. I do not know. And I wouldn't dare answer this question. And what was the third question? Oh, whether this new Leviathan is invincible. Well, of course it's not invincible. Okay. Because, well, uh, history is, is more devious. It's, it's more coy than a Leviathan. But also it's more devious than we are. So history does not wait uh, for what we have to say, and it will subvert Leviathan. Nothing is forever, nothing is eternal. The question for me is that I will not live to see that. I'm speaking personally. So it's not um, 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 invincible, says Duzinas? No, it is not. Do you have one last remark and give some advice as to what must be done? Advice? I never gave advice to anyone. Far from me. Can I ask for a, for a favor? Can you advise me something? No, no. I, 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 the most I did was advise one of my students to um, um, study for a PhD. Please do not make me again someone who gives advice. What about, what about the, the, the big old wise man? Oh, that's even worse than, than giving advice. So, we can't lose our hope? We can't lose hope? Of course not, says Kostadinos Tsukalas. We cannot lose hope. The hope is here. Hope is here. And hope is that things cannot go on as they are. These conditions are so explosive and so inflammable that I don't know whether this situation will lead to anarchies, to civil wars, to non-civil wars or what. I don't know what the methods are to subvert this Leviathan, to overturn, overthrow this Leviathan, but it cannot keep going because it is an explosive, an inflammable system. You can't have five billion destitute, hungry people all over the world 
who are sitting forever, um, docile, obedient, desperate, and 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 lowly, humiliated even. Of course, there is, we do run the risk of having further destruction, but that is not the point right now. All right, says Costas Luzinas. I think that you leave us at uh, with a on on a slightly. Um, positive note, and this is uh, important. And of course, on, on this positive note, we have a combination between your work and that of um, Kostadinos Pouladzas. Yes, uh, um, the speaker apologizes because they were speaking off microphone. It is very important to say that the last sentence or the last ideas that you gave us uh, leave us on a, on a positive note. And this positive note, in this rather asphyxiating atmosphere you described, may be combined with and remind us of the work of Nikos Pouladzas, in memory of whom we have this annual lecture. So I should like to thank you on behalf of all of us here, of the very few who are here, it's no more than six or seven of us, in this beautiful amphitheatre of the Goethe Institute, and a large number of people who followed your uh, speech over the internet. We have received uh, many congratulations, thanks, um, um, expressions of approval and agreement, and also, in a sense, uh, people saying that through your presentation, through your lecture, the people felt a breeze of something different than what is heard. Now, you, you mentioned Goethe. Uh, you mentioned Goethe. <coughs> now, something. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I, I can't do anything else. Ich bin hier. Ich kann nicht anders. So, we are at the Goethe Institute. Let's think about that as well. Right, so here we are, we're at the Goethe Institute in Athens, in Greece, of the year 2021, with all these problems. I believe that it was very important to hear your voice. It was a voice that was robust. It was a torrentious voice, a voice that can and does open roads. And this is why we help you, one and all, the few who are here and the many who heard us over the internet, and we hope that very soon we'll be able to read your speech, which will be published by the uh, Nikos Pouladzas Foundation in collaboration with the Niso uh, Publishing House. And I'd like to say in conclusion that the English translation of the text and um, the sign language um, um, translation, interpretation rather, version will be available on the Nikos Pouladzas Institution uh, webpage. Thank you so very much, Costadine Tsukala. Thank you, thank you one and all.